Join me in welcoming to Google, Jane Espenson. Thank you. This is, this is fun. I like being here at Google. OK, I'm going to take you back. Um, back. Yeah, pre-1992. Oh, no. Okay. So what were you doing then? You were in the I was in grad school. I was in, the... I was in college from 82 to 92. Right. <laughs> you, have, you have hit the arch archaeological level that is my college years. And what were you working on there? I was working in cognitive science. So right. I started in computer science, added linguistics as a double major as an undergrad, and then realized, hey, linguistics plus computer science equals cognitive science, um, which you can tell isn't a science because it has the word science in it. <laughs> uh, and spent five years doing that in grad school with George Lakoff. OK, so you went to reality and became a writer. So is there anything about your past, that 82 to 92, about uh, conceptualization of causation and metaphors that has informed your work? I wonder, I ask myself about that. I mean, for one thing, I needed those years to grow up. So um, my, my pseudo maturity is, uh, is a result of those years. But um, certainly the stuff that I like to write has a metaphorical layer in it. I don't, I, I'm not particularly interested in writing household drama. I like writing sci-fi. Um, when I write household drama, I like it to be something like the show Dinosaurs that I worked on, where it's like, it's a normal American household, but they're dinosaurs. Uh, <laughs> it just I find it allows you to speak more honestly about what's going on in the world. So the events on Battlestar Galactica could have taken place on an ordinary aircraft carrier out on water. But it's much more exciting that it's an aircraft carrier out in space. In space. Uh, <laughs> like, you, you can speak about war. Both those shows, Dinosaurs and Battlestar Galactica, took on Middle Eastern wars as a topic in a way that a show wouldn't be allowed to if it was like, we're going to do a show about US soldiers. Um, so we could switch around who was being the bad guy in any particular episode. We could move the mor morality around a bit um, or, or remove it entirely um, without there being sort of real world implications. We could, we could expose the real world. And so the fact that I like that metaphorical layer, it's probably not so much that grad school supplied me with that interest, but that they were both caused by the same initial interest in it. I like the idea of how do we really understand things? How do we filter things so that we can grapple with them? Uh, and that led me both to grad school and to my interest in sci-fi. Because certainly my interest in sci-fi predated grad mm -hmm. school. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so now I'm skipping a question because you're bringing up the moral cheat sheet. Yes. And I love that expression. Not yeah. having it, in other words. Uh, uh, the, this was an idea I had when I went in to speak. When, when you get hired on a show, they don't just look at your writing samples and say, OK, show up Monday. You also have to come in and meet and talk with the showrunner. And sometimes that meeting is very perfunctory. You, they, they know they like your writing. They know they are inclined to hire you. They just want to make sure that you're someone they can stand being in a room with, that you're not crazy. So I call this the wear pants meeting. Like, <laughs> <laughs> If you show up wearing pants, you're probably OK because they already like you. But sometimes you want to, if you really want the job, you want to go in armed with some insight about their show. So what I came in with at Battlestar was that I admired that it had no moral cheat sheet. And Ron, the showrunner, leaned so far out of his chair in excitement, I thought he was going to fall on the floor. And I was like, OK, good, I hit something. Um, yeah, because that's exactly what he'd been going for. For so many shows, you know that your hero is not going to make a bad choice, uh, not going to make an immoral choice. On Star Trek, for example, this was always the way. Um, so if Picard was advocating this, unless he'd been body switched, you knew that it was the right thing to do. So you could, as a viewer, sit back and go, OK, good, he's doing the right thing. You didn't have to think about the choice. Ron came out of that, out of the Star Trek world um, and then created Battlestar. And I think he was very much a reaction in his mind that he wanted to tell stories with shades of gray that weren't so clear cut. Um, and he really loved it. I picked up on the fact that even though we love and respect President Roslin and we love and respect Admiral Adama, doesn't mean they're always right. You don't have a moral cheat sheet to go, oh, who's making the argument? Adama, okay, that's the right thing to do. He did made wrong decisions, immoral decisions, 
all the time. Sometimes they were right and immoral. Sometimes they were wrong and immoral. But you had no way of knowing which one it was going into the argument. And often both sides had their merits, and you just had to go, which would I do? And, and, and it, was, it makes for a much more involving and participatory show. And I've thought a lot about what, what makes a cult hit, what makes a show with a fandom where, where the fans are so passionate about a show that they consider themselves a community. A lot of that has to do with the degree that they are engaged with the show, the amount to which it feels participatory for them, and an argument in which they're not being told passively which side to be on, but they have to actively engage and think about which side they'd be on. That's one of the ingredients in the recipe for cult, cult stardom. Uh, and Battlestar certainly, certainly achieved that, and I think that's a big part of why. Okay, so you prefer writing for TV as oh, opposed yes. to, okay, why? Oh my God, movies are awful. Um, <laughs> uh, they, in TV, we're the boss. In movies, directors are the boss. Um, and now that Joss Whedon has gone to movies, what's he doing? He's writing and directing. Um, because otherwise, you are like not even on the set. Your, your script is the launching point for visionaries to come in and imagine a world. Um, and the, writer is, the writer's work is done on most movies. Um, I don't care for that. In TV, we're the bosses. We create the world. We make the decisions. A director is hired week by week. They come in. Sometimes they're fantastic. Sometimes they're very visionary. Sometimes they come back a lot, and they become part of the fabric of the show. But a lot of times, it's just a guy that comes in for a week. And he has to do what we say. And if we don't think he's doing it right, we can fire him. Like, we have the power. We sit there on the set. Um, technically, if I want to give a note to an actor, I'm supposed to tell the director, and the director gives that note. But usually, we're sitting in a chair just like this, and I look over, and there's an actor right here saying, how should I say this? Like, oh, what did you mean by this? Or can I do this? And I'm just giving them direct instructions. You'd never have that on a feature set. Also, features never have to get made. There's no machine demanding that, like, well, we've got a time slot, and you said September 3rd, we got to put it on the air, we got to send it out. Like, nah, stuff gets shoved, stuff gets moved, they make new decisions, a new head of the studio comes in, all those things are sidelined. Cabin in the Woods has been done for years, you know, Joss's amazing new movie, and it's coming out now. Luckily, it is still fresh as a freshly cut thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because it's, um, it's amazing, it doesn't show the delay, but delays happen. TV is a monster that eats every week. You need to get stuff on the air. So I have had six episodes. In the last year, I had six episodes of Once Upon a Time, um, 11 episodes of Husbands. My Game of Thrones, I guess, was in this last year. Um, just And some, some other stuff I wrote that hasn't aired yet for like secret projects. Uh, you're like, OK, you end up with something, you know, 10 episodes, 11, whatever, a year. Whereas a feature writer can go four years working on a project and nothing hits the screen and maybe never will. Nonsense. Come to TV. <laughs> so you mentioned Game of Thrones. Yeah. And the scene that is to me is the most horrific is that golden crown. I knew. <laughs> and I w and, and uh, you mentioned in one of the interviews I watched, I watched many this weekend, um, that you don't write in sequence necessarily. That, that, can you talk about that? Yeah, I find that I want to write the scenes that I can most strongly visualize first. Um, and these are usually two-person emotional scenes in which people are sitting down and talking. And every script's got some of those. And they usually are the scenes that make you cry, that make you feel. Um, and uh, they are delicate little scenes, but they are also often the ones you have most clearly in your head when you sit down to work. Um, and you're not, you don't have a lot of considerations in your mind other than just pulling the emotion out. Um, you're not worrying about the geography and who spoke last. Has that person been standing silent in the corner for two pages? Or, like there, so I tend to go to those first. And those tend to give you a pretty good place to aim at. Like you've got to get the characters to the emotional state such that they can have that heart-to-heart -heart talk. Um, the last scenes I tend to write are action um, and great big group scenes where you've got seven people in the scene just because there's just so many moving parts. There's so much architecture to figure out. Like, 
and they're and they're often sort of procedurally scenes. Like all you really need to know about the fight is who won, because um, that's what drives you into the next scene. So you can kind of skip that for now. You go, oh, there's a fight and Buffy will win it. I'll go back later, <laughs> back later and figure out what she stabs him with. Like I'm, <laughs> but I'm not going to waste brain power on that right now when I've still got the big emotional moment to write. So I tend to write out of order. A lot of authors don't. A lot of TV writers just go front to back. On Game of Thrones, that was totally weird because it was pre-existing material. It was an adaptation. So uh, I was literally told the scenes, your episode will go from this page number to that page number. So the first thing I did was go to the book, look at the scenes, transcribe George R. R. Martin's dialogue, and then start messing with it from there. Because um, um, you know the amount of scene that's the amount of dialogue that's in one of his scenes could fill ten pages. In a, in and needs to fill two and a half for this scene. So you've got to pick and choose. Um, so there was a lot of work to be done, but the all those pivot points, all those big things are there. In a certain sense, everything is equal importance when someone has already done the heavy lifting of working out the heartbreak. Um, so that I, d I think I probably wrote that one less out of order than anything I've ever written. Because it was the, the the plowing of the field had been done. I was just going along planting in the furrows. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> remember that one? <laughs> I just thought of that. That's pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, well, Spike was one of my favorite characters in Buffy, and I like Rumpelstiltskin now too, a lot. Do you yeah. have a favorite character? Someone you like writing for? I uh, yeah, Rumpel has been amazing because you sort of can't go too far. Um, like a ca I've never dealt with a character who's so gloriously over the top. Um, Spike was amazing to write for. The, even though I don't in real life like bad boys, they're fun to write for. Um, uh, Anya I loved writing for because she's so blunt um, that in a way she was super easy because you just had to write what she was thinking, had to say what she was thinking. But in another way, it was like finding the funny thing that she's thinking was it was more of a challenge. I loved that. Um, Willow, and all those Buffy characters had such distinct voices. They were all fun to write for. I liked writing Giles. Learned an interesting lesson writing Giles. We were all, uh, we, in season three, there was a whole crop of new writers. And we were all getting used to writing these characters that already existed. I was, I was new. The show had been around for two years. And another writer and I were talking about coming up with Britishisms for Giles, making sure he sounded British. And Joss pointed out, <coughs> he sounds British, because he's British. <laughs> you don't have, it's not a novel where you have to use the language to convey to the audience that he's British. He's going to be British no matter what you write. <laughs> 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 so you don't have to work so hard to g make sure he's saying biscuit in every scene. Or, you know. <laughs> Um, just just let him talk, and he'll bring the Brit with him. And that was a huge lesson. You forget the difference between writing for, for a short story and writing for a screenplay sometimes, even if you've been doing it a long time. Um, but I loved writing. Torchwood was great. I got to write, speaking of British stuff, I got to write all the linguistic confusion of these Brits in the United States dealing with what do you mean by vest? What do you mean by pants? Why does all the, why are there so many kinds of milk in the grocery store? Or whatever, like, like there were just great little cultural things that were really fun to put in and uh, writing for Captain Jack and for Gwen were great. It's, I've just been really lucky that I've written for about 15 characters that I could point at and say, Starbuck, oh my God, like getting to write for Starbuck, uh, amazing. And oh, and uh, Cersei Lannister. I mean, like, like uh, 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 Peter Dinklage, Tyrion. Like, oh my God, that could there be a clearer, more charming, and sort of amoral but moral? I don't know. Great, great voices. I've been very lucky. That's quite a list. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, you try to pick one. <laughs> what do you? Who do well, you, you got think? Me thinking. I like all of those. Yeah, if you could write all of those, which one would you oh want to write? Can I come back to you on yeah, that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to turn to husbands now. Yeah. So that's quite brave of you. I mean, you did that. I was terrified. For yeah. that, too. Yeah. That, uh, season one was entirely out of pocket. Season two, um, the fans have put in 50K. I'm going to match that 50K. Um, and, um, and we're hoping that there may even be like some sponsor money or something coming in, because we want to do it that much better. We, we want to upgrade the cameras. 
um, get some get the red cameras um, and and like get better sound, better locations. We were shooting in a friend's house for season one, and there we had to often choose the take that didn't have the cat noises in it because <laughs> there were two pissed off cats locked in the bathroom of that house while we were shooting. <laughs> And so there's a lot of takes that just have this, <laughs> 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 like, uh, like we, we said, so we want to like rent a house where we can go and, and have a genuine production ha place. And it turns out renting a house that these two guys would have in LA is a substantial amount of money. Uh, and we want to get guest stars and, and real, like you wouldn't believe where the money goes. Production insurance, stuff you don't even think about. Like, that's like, oh, that's how many thousands? So um, it, 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 had, it was very brave. <laughs> Thank you for noticing. <laughs> um, yeah, I was scared to death season one. Now season two, I'm sort of going in like, OK, I know the product turned out well for season one. We did not fall on our face. We did not end up with things that I was, ter I was terrified that we'd get a call like, oh, the, we had a glitch, the digital files are gone, we didn't get day two of shooting. And like That would have killed us. We wouldn't have been able to do anything. We didn't have the location anymore. We couldn't have gone back and reshot. Like We just would have been lost. So I just was just trembling with fear every day. Now going in knowing, okay, I've seen it work once. We can do this. Shall we show people? Yeah, do you guys want to see a little of um, season one of Husbands? I'm very, very proud of it. <laughs> okay. These are scenes picked for Googlers. So they're very, very short little mini episodes. I'm going to show you two episodes, episode two and episode 11. The basic storyline is these two guys haven't been dating very long. They go to Las Vegas. They wake up drunk married. And they're high enough profile that they've got to deal with, like, what are the implications of getting a divorce? So this is episode two. This is they've just woken up in the Las Vegas bathroom, and they've noticed they're wearing wedding rings. Uh, so this is, this is their how they react. Oh, I'm going to full screen first. This is their initial reaction to this terrible situation they find themselves in. No, no, we're too famous for something this fucked up to happen. Out athlete and America's gay sweetheart married during drunken Vegas weekend. Now that's too long for a headline. See, this is why I'm an actor, not a writer. Jesus, we're gonna look bad. And we're gonna make the cause look bad. And we're gonna look bad. Well, people already kinda expect this sort of nonsense from me. We can't be married. They're, they're novelty rings, exchanged in the spirit of high camp such as we gays are known for. Satirical performance pop art. Yes! Uh, we celebrated marriage equality by getting fake married Vegas style, which is hilarious because we've only dated six weeks. And for two of those, I couldn't stand you. What? And we know it's fake, because if we got real married, we need a license, and I don't see a license. There may be a document in my pants. Certificate of marriage. It's notarized. We drunk notarized. Okay, 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 okay. Use your word. Annulment. Um, marriages can be annulled if you're too drunk to know what you're doing. My teammates do it all the time. So that's why you're called the Dodgers. Wrong time, but it's comedy gold. Track. I'm serious. If we act fast and no one finds out, it's as if it never happened. Google alert! It's a Google alert! It's about us. Is that how you spell travesty? Yeah. Are you sure? I won a spelling bee once. Really? Oh, so much to learn about each other. And this is the very last episode. So the very last episode, so they've been through a bunch of stuff, and um, they're dealing with a, a little bit of last-second panic conflict before they settle in and realize that, uh, that maybe this will work after all. This is because I didn't update my relationship status on Google Plus? Yeah. I didn't think about it. Yeah, I figured. Now that you're aware, maybe you could... Sure, next time I'm online. <sighs> yeah, I'm the girl. Select, married, done. Thanks, babe. I really do think you are... Hang on, I'm updating my status. Home with hubby. Smiley face. Oh, 
That's sweet. I Hang on, I'm tweeting. Hashtag K I S my H U B. Mm-hmm, I get I'm it. I'm emailing it. Okay. Tagging. Cheek stumbling. Will you? And dig. Okay. Now, what was it you wanted to talk about? I just, I, I want Oh, hang on, I need to twit pick the new tattoo above my ass that says, Mrs. Brady Kelly, smiley face. Done? Because I got it, I, and I've got a better idea. How about we stop talking, get into bed, and find something else to do? Winky face. So we're really married. Like, for realsies. <laughs> yes, it's beautiful. And politically necessary. And I love you. You said I should surprise you. Flawless execution. I love you too. Hey, Cheeks. Yes, darling. Um, what's your real name? We mentioned Google twice, and we didn't even know we were coming here. I think it's time for our questions. Sure. So, oh, yeah. In general, how does writing for a TV series work? For example, between the credited screenwriter for that episode and the more permanent creative team running the show, who's responsible for which decisions, and how do they work together? It's a great, great question. Um, uh, you work in a room. Um, every day I go to work and I go to a room and it's full of funny people and we sit there and we break an episode. Um, so we know which episode's coming up next. We know the story, general story usually that we want to tell in it. And it becomes, it comes down to the showrunner guiding a discussion. In this, in my current show, Once Upon a Time, we have twin showrunners. Not really. They're partners and they run the show together. Um, and so they will say, okay, we want to do a Cinderella story this week, and we sort of figure it's probably about this. Um, first thing we talk about is what's the theme of it? What are we trying to say with this episode? That's really important. Shows that don't start out there often sort of fail to get one of the important ingredients in making a cult hit, which is that people have to feel that there's a reason to watch it, that there's a reason to tell the stories. So start with theme. Um, and, you know, it could be as simple as love conquers all. It doesn't have to be deep. Um, but it has to be real. It has to be something you really believe. And then you start figuring out, okay, well, what's going to happen to her? Uh, we think it's gonna, she's going to come up against this bad guy, and we think at the end she'll be in this place. And you start working it out by act breaks. Act breaks are the moments that go into each commercial. Um, there used to always be four acts in a TV show. Now we're up to six. Um, there's been a, there's been some act inflation because then they get more commercial breaks, um, so you've got to figure out a story that can turn that many times. So stories have actually gotten perhaps a little shallower in the last few years because there you have to you're just getting your feet under you in an act and you've got to turn the story. You've got to come up with that big dramatic hey this isn't what we thought, but you have to do it more often. Um, if you work on a show like Game of Thrones, you don't have to do that because you don't have commercial breaks. So it's, it's very different. Um, but the, so the showrunner's responsibility is guiding that discussion. Uh, at a certain point, you've filled up a whiteboard 
with all the details of all the scenes that are going to go in this episode, in which order, and which ones are right before act breaks. And at a certain point, you declare it broken, which means it's fixed. Um, <laughs> and someone is, one of the writers is sent home to write it. That's when that writer, I mean, that writer's had a responsibility of, of participating in the room, uh, pitching ideas, pitching lines, um, like saying, you know, things as little as, I think he should put cinnamon in his coffee. This was a big discussion early on of like whether characters should bond over something they don't like in the coffee shop or something they do like in the coffee shop. It's a tiny, tiny point. But that, you know, you, your contribution can be that small. Or you could have said, actually, I don't think this is a week to do Cinderella because I just had an idea that that's a different, a whole different idea. So you've participated in the room. Uh, and But your work, to me, really starts when you're sent home and you've got this beat sheet, this list of the scenes and what's going to happen in each of them. And you have to turn that around and come back with a 52-page document with every decision filled in, every line of dialogue written. Um, that's your main duty as a writer. Now, on most shows, uh, ri writers, particularly higher level writers, are also producers. So you, theoretically, you go to set, you go to the show and tell with the prop guy, and you say, no, not that cigarette light or that one. Uh, or you, and you go to costumes and you say, I do not like that hat or whatever it is that you're saying, and then you sit on set and you sit with the director and you say things like, I don't think we got it. I, that, that performance wasn't quite right, um, or whatever. But it's, it's, it's very cold. The set's a tedious place to be. Uh, and on our particular show, our set is up in Vancouver and we don't go up. So our job is pretty, pretty much ends when you turn in that draft of the script. Um, so. The, produ the executive producers, though, have to be worried about everything. They have to fly up to Vancouver and look at the hats. They have to deal with the manager of the actor that's calling. Um, they have to talk with ABC Marketing about, about the posters and what gift they're going to give at Comic-Con and whether they should be inviting the press in to talk to them about you know, the mid-season episode. Um, they're deciding lots and lots and lots of stuff that has nothing to do with the, what's the next line of dialogue in the script. Um, this is a reason I really like being a writer. Um, I don't know. Does that answer your questions about the different responsibilities? Because there's a lot of different, a lot of different ways to go. Oh, I can also talk about younger writers versus more experienced writers. When you're hired, you're hired as a staff writer. Built into your contract is a series of promotions. Your next season, you will be a story editor, even though you're not editing anything. You're doing the exact same thing you did as a staff writer. The next year, you're executive story editor. Then you're co-producer. And you may think, ah, that's the jump to producer. No, co means not. Co-producer's <laughs> not a producer. Step after that is producer. Then you're, then you're a producer. Then supervising producer. We just lost some light. <laughs> um, and so you, you move up through these lengths of these, these insane titles, all of which are just different kinds of writers. And your, your producing duties may or may not expand as your title goes up. So um, where did you want to go with Caprica? Um. Where did I want to go with Caprica? Caprica was handed to me. I, I was not involved in the conception of it. Um, I really knew nothing about it. I hadn't seen the pilot. Um, uh, the casting was all done. The hiring of the staff was essentially done. And I was brought in to write it um, with, and or not write it, to run it with Ron Moore. So we had an initial sit down with Ron Moore where he sort of laid out where it would go and I did my best to stick to where he wanted it to go. So you didn't have your own ambition for it before Kevin Murphy came in or anything? Um, I had I had my thoughts about what, what characters I felt were working, what storylines I felt were working. Uh, I was working within a big team. Um, David Icke was there uh, also as executive producer. Sci-fi um, has a lot of authority over their shows. So I was part of a group that was steering it in directions. Um, and um, I, I, I think the show turned out remarkably well for having so many cooks. Um, <laughs> uh, and yeah, it was, 
it was a little hard to know exactly where it was going. I think it was as most season one shows do, you know, even though it was a continuation sort of of the, the Battlestar universe, it was also a season one of a show with a very different feel to it. We were a domestic drama um, with robots. <laughs> um, and so I think there wasn't there wasn't huge anonymity of decision about exactly where it should go, and I think that to a certain extent it was kept open on purpose of like let's see what's working, let's see what's not working. So if you if you are implying that there may there, m there may be a feeling of a lack of a unified vision, I think that's probably true. And the second quick question is, how is it in the husband's comedy that the one man didn't know his uh, husband's real name when he had a Google Plus account? <laughs> 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 Cheeks, Cheeks signed up for the Google Plus account with the name Cheeks. He also looked at his own marriage license and didn't see his real name. We had that marriage license printed up, so it just says Cheeks. <laughs> so I think it's like Cher. I think Cheeks has had his name legally changed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there's a question right here. So I, I wanted to tell you how much I love your work. Um, you. Noticing your name in the credits was sort of a, a starting point for me in realizing that there were writers who were making these characters saying these things, which is odd because I had at one point thought I would I would pursue writing as a career. Mm -hmm. And I realized that over time I kept seeing these characters who were making me feel things and your name kept populating for the credits. Aww. And I would watch the DVD content and realize, I would listen to things you were saying about the characters, realize this wasn't an accident, mm -hmm. that there are writers who really shape and inform how we experience TV. And with the internet now, that's really changing. Like, I see what you're doing with Kickstarter, and I'm excited about this project, and I can directly connect to you and inspire this project to happen because of a writer I believe in. So I'd really like to hear from you about where sort of new media is taking things in terms of the connection. It's not just the actor anymore right. who's the visible presence. So um, oh, I'd love to hear from you. So many fizzy, fizzy thoughts coming off that. Number one of which is the experience you describe I had pre-social media, which is I read an interview with April Kelly, who was a MASH writer, and seeing the woman's name talking about writing for MASH is the one that made me go, that's a thing I can do. Um, so I'm glad I could do that, because <laughs> um, that was done for me. Um, and I'm so thrilled to hear that that's your view of the Kickstarter, because I was actually very reluctant to do it. like. Because I knew I could still I could put in money, um, and I didn't want to take money from people who have less money than me. I mean, I was putting in all I could afford, but I know like that I'm, people might be scraping around for their ten dollar bill to give, and I didn't want that. That would that would hurt my soul. Uh, and so when we realized that we could give incentives that would make it worthwhile for people, so they would get something of value, and we also realized that giving them a season two, a high quality season two, was was something that, that would make it worth it. And beyond that, the sense that they're involved in it. That's what really surprised me and made me thrilled, was that people were enjoying giving because they felt like they got to be part of the team and they got to support a project they believed in. They get to support marriage equality. They get to support good comedy. They get to support online content. Like There's a whole bunch of stuff you get to support. And, um, and the Kickstarter is still sitting up there. Go to Kickstarter. Um, <laughs> Look for husbands. We're there, and we and every dollar we get will help us make it more and better and bigger. Um, but yeah, that's and and yeah, the future of social media. The fact that crowdfunding now makes it possible to do for even for anyone to like with a with a dream and a good big idea to get out there, raise some money, make something on your own. Boy, I got to think that the that online is where the future of the new wave of content is going to come from. And because you don't have to be a broadcaster, you don't have to appeal to everyone in every demographic, you can take risks. You can do a show like ours with this, this young, sexy married couple. TV will put gay marrieds on TV, but they generally won't make them sexual. They do everything to desexualize them. They cast a straight actor as one of the guys, or they give them babies or something. As much as I love Modern Family, I love Modern Family, but there is a certain trend to, to make you not think that these guys are having hot sex. And our show is all about these are newlyweds. Of course they are. Um, but they're still making every mistake that every other newlywed couple does. That's what all newlyweds do. Like, and so we wanted, we wanted to do content that was 
that was a little spicy, a little intriguing, something you can't get everywhere else. And, and online is totally the place to do it. And I just have a feeling, even though right now this is a mechanism for us to feed money into a system, I got to think that ultimately online will become a place where, where it isn't just a one-way thing, where, where someone's going to crack the code for figuring out how to make this a legitimate two-way conversation between us and the audience. There we go. One of the things on the flyer there, in fact, the headline uh, introducing you there is that you're a Hugo Award-winning author for your work on right. Buffy. Uh, you're probably not aware that there was actually controversy in a, uh, when they created a category for the Hugo Awards oh. that primarily was aimed at television shows. There used to only be just one that covered movies and TV, and it mostly went to movies. Right. And some of the criticisms of it were actually, oh, there's no reason just to create a category for Buffy. Because at the time, that <laughs> was what it Now, as nice. it happens nowadays, it's being said, now there's no need for a category just for Doctor Who. Right, uh, right. But uh, had you been familiar, had you heard of the award even before you received it? And, oh, and Hugo, it, was, yeah. Was it worth, one of the major criticisms from within the, 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 the World Science Fiction Society is, well, nobody in movie and television ever pays attention to that. They don't really give a, a darn about that, you know. Oh, was, was that worthwhile, did you think? Uh, yeah, oh, my Hugo. That's all I really have. I have, a, I have half a Hugo and two streamies, and that's all I have. Um, because sci-fi stuff is generally not recognized in Hollywood. And so to have the Hugos recognize it is like our only way to get legitimacy. Um, the um, Battlestar Galactica won... So what was that? What's the really fancy one? Um, that's Saturnite. Uh, Saturn, I no, think. Saturn's no? not fancy. Um, they <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen one. Saturn is adorable, and I would love one because I don't have one. Um, but they won like a like a. It was a, like a, it wasn't a Bradbury. It was anyway. It was a. No, no, it wasn't even a science fiction award. It was like an award for like being genius media in a mainstream kind of award. We'll figure it out. Someone will look it up. Um, but uh, uh, I know. <laughs> Somebody pull your phone out. What did Battlestar Galactica? But they won it the year before I was there, so I don't have it. Um, but yes, those awards carry big clout in Hollywood because those the showbiz awards, yeah, everybody knows them, everybody has them. The non-showbiz awards are like, oh, you're legit. You formed, like the real people who, the smart people gave you the award. So yeah, the <laughs> Hugo Award is huge. Hugo Award's bigger than any of them. I am so pleased with it. I'll bring, I'll bring that up the next <laughs> time someone criticizes it. Yeah, no, don't criticize it. And I was- I Suggest was, it was the Peabody that you- that, Peabody, yeah. Yeah, thank so. you. By the way, I, I was sympathetic to your time about with husbands, the worries about filming in a house and so on. When I was in college, we did our, our, our science fiction club filmed two one-hour-long Doctor Who fan movies, and it was the same thing. In a house, oh or we don't, you know, we're about to lose the light, that kind of thing. And oh, then, it's so hard <laughs> stuff that you don't... Uh, I learned so much doing web content as opposed to, uh, to big TV um, about things that you don't think about on the set, like... like feeding the crew <laughs> that sort of sort of happens automatically but on the web series I'm stopping at Taco Bell and ordering 20 burritos at the drive through before I go to set it's like because somebody's got to feed them um, and just like oh wait nobody remembered to bring the champagne glass all right well we have an enormous margarita glass that's funnier anyway like, <laughs> uh, like great like great happenstance, but also great panic of we don't have. Uh, uh, there are two scenes in this in which Sean forgot, uh, who plays Brady, forgot his shoes. So he's shoeless in a couple scenes and you just don't pan down enough to see it. Uh, but yeah, just things happen and, and you learn. And I also learned a big thing about being in the editing room, which is on all previous projects, I thought if if a line had to be cut or something had to be changed in the editing room, I felt like, yeah, that was a problem with the script. I should have caught it at the script stage. Now I go, no, there was no problem with the script. This is how it had to be. Having the script a certain way got a certain performance. Now we cut it at it in the editing room. That is, that is the best way to have made this moment happen. Uh, you don't, y it really is the next, the next pass. I had, no, I had heard that, I'd never believed it. So it's something that a lot of people learn in film school. I'm just learning now. I think we have a yellow question. Yes. Yes. Hi, my name is Tricia. Um, one thing I've always liked about your shows is that they tend to pass the Bechtel test with flying colors. Yeah. 
And I was wondering if this is a coincidence, and if it's not, is it something you have to fight for? And have you ever encountered resistance to having like multiple female protagonists in a scene, in an episode, or even in a show premise? You do what you can in the writer's room. Depending on the room that you're in, you may re meet some resistance. If there's a scene with two girls and they're talking about a guy, you can say, you know, you got, have you guys heard of the Bechdel test? Um, that's often how I do it, because then they feel like it's not just me and an agenda. It's like fans are going to notice, and then sometimes that pays it, that, that will help. But I haven't actually faced that in a long time. Um, if you look at Once Upon a Time, we just have so many lead females with Regina, Mary Margaret, and Snow. Um, I mean, no, I, I doubled one up. Snow is Mary Margaret and Emma. Like, uh, it's impossible for them to be giggling about boys in every scene. So there's just um, tons and tons and tons of Bechtel falling left and right. We had one that worried me a little bit when we had Snow and Red Riding Hood talking about their men. And it was, you know, Snow going like, I think you like this guy. What are you going to do? You're going to run away with him. But that scene turns into, let's go kill a wolf. <laughs> 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 so after a while, I calmed down. And I was like, you know what? This one passes. <laughs> um, and you don't want to be so crazy to it that nobody can ever talk about relationships, because relationships are at the heart of a lot of people's lives. So I, I, try, to, I try to always keep it in mind. Sometimes, sometimes you get it in, sometimes you don't. Yeah. Something that makes it unique is that it's not that the relationships are the only reason the woman's in the show. Buffy right. was ultimately a show about a woman who had a job fighting. Absolutely. <laughs> and there were other important decisions um, beyond Bechdel in, in how Buffy was treated. Joss made really sure that nobody ever challenged her ability to lead on the basis that she was a woman or a girl, whatever she was. Um, it was, it was, they might challenge her on other reasons, like, you're exhausted, you're crazy, you're infected with a demon's bond, or whatever. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was never, you're a woman. And similarly, on Battlestar Galactica, President Rosalind was never challenged on that basis. And I loved that Ron set up a world in which there was not a history of gender discrimination. Uh, and in fact, when I got to write the Face of the Enemy web series, I co-wrote those, uh, in which we learned that Lieutenant Gaeta is gay, although I hate to even use that word gay in the Battlestar Galactica universe because they don't seem to have a word because it's just the, like some people love here and some people love there. They've never thought of separating them out and giving them a different name. Um, but we learned that in that episode, and I tried really hard to write that so that this was nobody was shocked by that. Th there's actually a shot in it of Colonel Ty giving looking askance. That wasn't intended to be uh, you've got a boyfriend. That was intended to be like, how come I didn't know you had a relationship with another crew member? <laughs> like, um, so that I hope people read that in the way it's intended. That um, that writing a show, that what a great freedom that is. And it's another way to sort of apply metaphor. Let's go like, here's our world as seen if this had, if we didn't have this in our history. Look what's the same, look what corresponds, look what's different. I love that. All right, uh, this one from Trisha Weir. Um, if you could choose any show you've ever worked on and retcon it out of cancellation with a new season, <laughs> which show would it be? <laughs> <sighs> I, it's interesting because sometimes that doesn't mean it's the show you love best. I don't think, I think Buffy ended well um, and has been continued in the comic book. So that would be a weird one to sort of go back and continue. Where do you continue it from? The end of the current comic book season. Um, Torchwood ended too soon. I mean, we don't know if there's going to be more Torchwood. Russell's dealing with stuff, but um, I would love to see more Torchwood. Um, Obviously, they're, they're, you know, once upon a time, I'm certain will continue. So th that one's good. I'm getting to make more husbands. Um, Firefly. Firefly deserved more. Firefly ended too soon, had stories left to tell. Joss was excited about it. The cast was, that's why he made Serenity. It's like there was more to do. I would love, love, love to write an another season of, of Firefly. Why, why in God's name? This is my question. Was Firefly canceled so soon? I, yeah, I actually don't know. I, uh, I don't think I could if I did know. But um, I think it just 
was probably a mismatch between what Fox was finding profitable on their airwaves. I, 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 that was still a time when ratings triumphed over DVD sales. Like the studio makes the DVD money, the, the network sells the advertising, so they, the network cares about the ratings. You can be huge in DVD sales and, and the network may not even know about it or care about it. So um, I think studios in which the studio and the network are all one entity it sort of happens at, at sci-fi more. I think they're more likely to keep a DVD hit show around um, than Fox was because I don't know that they cared about the cult following. They were just looking at the weekly numbers and I'm sure they were probably in their spreadsheets, they were probably right. The numbers didn't justify it. I think there were more numbers they weren't seeing, but I'm guessing. So you're telling me that short-term thinking killed Firefly? Short-term thinking kills a lot. <laughs> All right, and yeah. I have one more, more question off the dory for you. Uh, this is from some dude named Dan Block. Um, <laughs> and the question is, your website says you wear very bright colors. Are you sure about that? <laughs> I generally do. When I come to an appearance like this, I try to class it up. So, uh, but I don't know that I've ever even worn this black blouse before. Like normally, I'm in very, very bright colors. Um, but it reflect. I, I like to think that's reflected in my writing. I always try to put humor in anything I write, even a dark show. But today, I'm giving you dark, Jane. <laughs> Uh, just a question on your on the, on the business of writing. You've given some perspective on what normally happens when a showrunner, you know, kind of goes forward with everything. Um, when you look at a show that becomes a big success um, and writers kind of disperse to other shows, um, it seems like that unified vision that you spoke of earlier seems to deviate. And a good example is something like maybe Lost, where mm -hmm. they clearly had a vision, but over time it kind of really deviated from that. Just because, from from my perspective, it just seems like maybe a lot of the writers kind of jump ship and kind of did their own thing, but is that how it normally happens uh, in Hollywood? Um, I thought you were going to ask a different question, so my mind's still there. Uh, shows sometimes weaken over age, and sometimes because people leave. Sometimes they get stronger over age because someone comes in with it with a great strong vision and reinvigorates it or vigorates it. Um, so I think it really matters show to show. Um, I'm trying to think of a show. Like I worked on Ellen, and Ellen, el first season of Ellen was called These Friends of Mine. And then like they fired all the writers and they got rid of a bunch of cast members and it came back as Ellen and then it sort of stumbled along with an 11 rating for a while and then they were like, oh, she wants to come out. Let's incorporate it in that show. Oh my God, a season of huge, huge, huge ratings. Like the show found itself. The show was about something. Then, my st then they were all fired. New staff came in. <laughs> Um, I don't know where they went, actually. They, they may have just all, I don't know what happened, but I came in for the season after she came out. We were telling great stories. The show had a reason to exist, which it never had before. It never had a hook. It was just a girl in a coffee shop. And then sometimes a bookstore. Like, um, So we had a reason to tell. We were telling exciting stories, stories that had never been told before. But eventually the numbers went back down to the 11. Like The show went back to its rating of the people who really loved it and loved her. Um, so it went away, but I felt like that was a show that got stronger um, because somehow some you found a thing for the show to be about. Um, so I think I think lots of different things can happen. Shows have a lifespan. Um, a lot of shows they have about five seasons in them and they go away. I mean, British TV takes this to an extreme. There's about six episodes in the show. Let's do that. Um, so uh, sometimes it's about shows outliving their natural lifespan. The story's done. Let's make more story. Um, but what I thought you were going to talk about is the way that a show can have a, an academy in it so, that's so strong. The writers can learn so much that they then, when they go to other shows, they take that philosophy with them which is what happened to Buffy, because almost all the Buffy writers are now like running shows or, or doing other big things in other shows, and they all brought with them the core of the Joss beliefs about make me feel, make this about something, what does this mean to the main character, like go deeper, mix your genres, make funny in your sadness, put sadness in your funny. Like you, you walk away with those things and any show you go to, you're gonna bring those too. And so the Buffy, 
the, the Buffy explosion sent Buffy's stardust out into the universe. <laughs> I think we have time for one last question. Yeah, uh, what are some of your favorite shows that you didn't write or perhaps wish you could partake in writing? Oh, MASH. <laughs> Where have you gone? Lou Grant, Mary Tyler Moore, Bob Newhart, The Odd Couple. A lot of the shows from my childhood that I grew up watching and imagining, including stupid shows. Welcome back, Cotter, The Love Boat. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> like, I had stories in my head for those shows and never got to write them. Um, I would love to have written an episode of The Wire. Um, I would love to have written mm, so many good shows that I would love to get my teeth in. Sometimes a really dark show, um, maybe like Breaking Bad or something, where it's like, I would love to see how much humor I could get in there. How much can it bear? That was my favorite thing to do on Battlestar, was to take a really dark scene and see if I could put a joke in it. Because th that joke is going to play twisted, sick, and even darker than if they hadn't made a joke. And <laughs> so I love that. that. There was a scene where they're talking about how everyone's so starving on the ship that they're eating paper. And then eventually, they stop eating paper. Why is that paper shortage? And it's like, <laughs> That kills me, because it's just so sad. <laughs> and yet it's got the structure of a joke. Like, I love that. So I'd love to pick, pick something really dark. But right now, like, I'd love to like write a community or something, but I don't have the chops. I feel like I'm, I come out of comedy. I spent a lot of years writing comedy. That show's so good. I can't touch that. I, I would be writing, I feel, a lesser species. Um, give me a dramatic show, and let me, let me put some fun in it. So what's the darkest thing out there right now? Point me at it. I'll do it. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming to Google today. Thank you. Yeah.